So we get married, move to New York, and my questions change once again because Esquire magazine has started this column called What I've Learned. It's the wisdom from some of the most extraordinary people in the world. And now I get to take what I've learned talking to these people on buses and trains and translate it into conversations with some of the most powerful, talented, and compelling people on the planet. So it took me 10 years to learn that an interview was more than meet the press, but another 20 to understand that it was more than having the time of my life with Jeff Bezos, George Clooney, Woody Allen, the chef Wolfgang Puck. Because now I am here with you in South Africa. So let me tell you how changing questions can change your life. Changing your questions can certainly help you establish a deeper connection with everybody in this room. Changing your questions can help you master the art of conversation. But in order to do so, you've got to arrange your questions in a very specific way. First, as I mentioned, aim that initial question at the heart, then go to the head, and follow the two on a pathway to the soul. Now, this goes way beyond business. Great in questions impact every aspect of your life. The right question can help you find a spouse. It can help you find a better spouse. <laughs> I know what kind of crowd this is. <laughs> it can help you guide your kids with more insight. And not only that, it can change your community. It can change your country. I leave the United States of America just after an election and a brutal campaign that lasted almost two years. And it's so sad to say that I watched my country lose the ability to ask questions. I would turn on my television and one station, somebody would be yelling at, yelling, you idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. I would turn to another station. No, they're the idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. On and on and on. We lost the ability to say, why do you think like that? We just started blaming. We just started pointing our fingers. And now, I believe we have trouble because of it. And so, what you see here tonight, what Mark has created, is the evidence of the power in a question. That a guy would say, how might I rewire the education system here? And then ask, that guy in the United States, Cal Fussman, what if I brought him here? Would that help the process along? And I have to say thank you, Mark, because you thought you were rewiring education here. You have rewired my life. I will never be the same after this trip. I'm already not the same. I already met a woman going to Mars. She's going to be my friend. But let me get back to the questions because I've already spoken about the benefits of aiming that first question to the heart. Now let's move to the head. The word why is a great way to start a question to the head because the word why gently nudges someone to think more deeply about something they already know. That's why during that exercise I asked you the question, why is your best friend your best friend? People will search for that answer. Listen carefully as they do. Look them in the eye as if they're the only person on the planet. If you have to ask a follow-up question, ask it in a way that invites a response and never pushes a response away. And if you have to ask a predictable question, ask it in an unpredictable way. 
the answers you get and the way you pay attention to those answers will clear a pathway to the soul. Now, it's very difficult to explain what it's like to enter somebody's soul, but I hope this story will give you a little taste of the experience. So let me take you back summer 2003. The editors of Esquire magazine call me up and say, Cal, your dream has come true. We'd like you to spend a week with your childhood hero, Muhammad Ali, and write a cover story about the experience. Now, everybody knew at this point that Muhammad had Parkinson's disease. This was 20 years after his last fight. And we'd last seen him on a world stage at the Olympics in Atlanta, 1996, when he held a torch in his shaking hand and he tried to light the Olympic cauldron. And he got it close, but he wasn't getting it in the right spot. And we're all watching as time is passing, and now we're starting to think, what if he can't do it? And he's shaking, and it's not lighting and not lighting, as if the world is holding its breath. And finally, it catches. A flame erupts, and so does everybody's heart. But that was the last we really saw Muhammad on, on a world stage. And that was seven years before. So the editors say to me, we, we just want to know, how is he doing now? So I'm sent to Special Olympics in Dublin, Ireland. Both Muhammad and Nelson Mandela are invited guests. I go to meet Muhammad in his hotel room, and he comes through these double doors of his suite on slow, tender steps. I put out my hand. But he knows that he's my childhood hero and he opens his arms and he takes me in a huge embrace. And then he goes over to a soft leather cushy chair and he slumps in it. I take a seat at the sofa next, next to it and I look at him and say, champ, I came here to find out about all the wisdom you've accumulated in your life. But he doesn't seem to pay attention. He seems preoccupied with his right arm, he's shaking. And now his left arm is shaking too. And his breathing is kind of labored. And I'm thinking, should I call his wife? Now, not only are his arms shaking, but his right leg and his left leg start shaking and his breathing is coming in gasps. Tim, Tim, are you all right? And his head comes up real slow just to where it gets to my eye level, and he says, just barely above a whisper, scared you, huh? 